Hello and welcome to Code Slicer. We all know that anything looks better with an inner shadow on it. Unfortunately, we don't get them natively in Swift UI yet. We might do in the next version, who knows. But until then, we have to do it ourselves and I'm going to show you how. Now, the approach we need to take is dependent on the type of thing we want to put an inner shadow on. That's why in this episode, we're going to be focusing on text. In the next episode, we'll move on to views and shapes and we'll finish off with images using their transparency to drive the shadow. So by the end of this series, you'll have robust ways of generating inner shadows way ahead of whenever Apple decides to lay that functionality at our feet. So enough dawdling, let's start doodling. Right, here we have a relatively inoffensive four letter word, although obviously that's subjective, and we're going to put an inner shadow on it. The way we're going to do that is by putting an extension on text. So let's do that right now. Private extension text. And this function is going to be called inner shadow, which is going to be generic on view, which is actually going to be the background. And this whole thing is going to return some view. For the moment, let's just make it return itself so we can use it up here in a shadow. And we'll give it a background, my favorite linear gradient. Linear gradient with the colors red and orange. And we'll send that to the bottom trailing corner. And then we'll resume. So at the moment, nothing is happening because all we're doing is returning the same text. So let's start building up our inner shadow, which is going to consist of several layers. The first layer is going to be the background. And you might think you could just return the background to start with, but let's see what happens when I try. Background. And look what's happened. It's got really, really small. And this is because I'm using the fixed size modifier on line 11. When you use a view that's not text and you put a fixed size on it, it shrinks down to a small size. So what's happening right now is that we are ignoring the text completely. And this modifier in a shadow at the moment is replacing the whole thing with a linear gradient, which we're then putting a fixed size on and getting something like this. So what we need to do is tell this background on which canvas it's going to be applied. In this case, it's going to be the text. So we're going to use the overlay modifier here self overlay and then put the background on that and then you'll see that the background now is the size of the text remember i've got padding on the sides so obviously we need to restrict that to just the text so i'm going to use the text itself as a mask and this is one of the advantages of using an extension like this because we always have access to that text by just referring to self so it's going to look like this background mask self like that there is our background masked to the text doesn't it look wonderful so now that the background is sorted out we want to start layering on top the shadow so what i'm going to do is duplicate this overlay like this comment the first one out and then i'm going to replace this with a z stack z stack and in this z stack i'm going to start putting our shadow now you might be wondering why has it gone black? And the reason it's gone black is because by default, text has the foreground color of the system foreground color, which in this case is black. Now we don't need this black and it would cause problems with masking later on. So we can get rid of it like this. Self, foreground color, clear. All right, now we've got a blank canvas essentially to work on. Now, one thing you might note here is that we haven't used foreground color when defining the font upstairs. And that's because when you apply a foreground color to a text, it's a one shot deal in a hierarchy. You cannot apply a different foreground color to that text. So because we want to be using the foreground color modifier in this, I need some text that has not had the foreground color applied to it. And you'll see where I'm going to be using that in just a second. So the next layer we're going to put on top of this is going to be our shadow layer. And that looks like this. Self foreground color. And we're going to say it's the color with 0 0.3 of white in it. This is the gray we're going to be using for our shadow to start with. And there you can see I've created a new instance of text with a different foreground color applied. On top of this, I'm going to put a layer of white. 
So foreground color, white. This is our shadow. Now, don't worry about the fact that we can see a little bit of the shadow color underneath. You are always going to get some bleeding like this. It's not specific to Swift UI, it's just the way anti-aliasing works, and you have to deal with it in different ways. We don't have to deal with it at all in this case because we are going to be blurring the white. So let's do that now. Blur 5. And what we're now looking at is the inner shadow construction. That is what we're going to be using to overlay on top of the background, which will then give the appearance of an inner shadow. So let's think about what we've got. We've got gray text. Above that, we've got a blurred white text so we can see the gray coming through at the edges. And the blur radius is equivalent to the shadow radius on a normal shadow. And now that we've got our shadow ready to apply, we can put the background back in. And we can't see anything yet because we've got these solid colors on top of it. But now we're going to use the blend mode for our Z stack of multiply, like this. Blend mode, multiply. Okay? And you might think to yourself, that looks a bit rubbish. And it does. This is not what I promised you. It doesn't look like an inner shadow at all. So what's going on here? Well, the problem is a bug with the way that SwiftUI handles blend modes. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, as in this case. It often happens with Multiply, actually, and I don't know if it's ever going to be fixed, but sometimes putting things in a drawing group helps, and sometimes, as we're going to do now, is putting the things you're multiplying into a mask. Now, after discussing the behavior of masks with Javier at SwiftUI Lab, it is our belief that there is a rasterization step that happens when using a mask. It is that step that I believe allows blend modes to work when used in combination with masks. There is, of course, a healthy amount of speculation involved here, but until I know differently, that's the story I'm going with. So let's put this mask in now. Mask, self. And we've got our beautiful working inner shadow. Now let's parameterize this to make it a bit more useful. Because we've got two things that we can control here, the opacity and the radius. So let's pull those into parameters for this particular extension. So let's say that the radius is a CG float with a default value of 5, and the opacity is a double with a default value of 0 0.7. Then we can say that the shadow color is equal to 1 minus the opacity. And the blur radius is equal to the radius passed in. And now when we resume, we should end up with the same result as before. But now we can control these from outside. So let's play around with this by putting in some more text. We'll double it up. We'll say Adam is, we'll put the multi-line text alignment to center and the second bit of text will say hulk and remember that because the background is just a view we can put anything on here so we can put an image for example image hulk eyes resized to fit and there we are now because we've got complete control of the opacity and the radius of the shadow we can play around with it a bit because as you can see, the contrast on that Hulk image means that we can't quite see the shadow as well. So for that one, I can change the opacity to one. Opacity one. Now we can see the shadow a little bit better and let's play around with the softness of the shadow in the top one. So I can say radius is equal to 10 for a really soft shadow or we could go for a really harsh shadow with three. But let's leave it at five for now. And that's not all you can do. Because we are controlling completely where that shadow is, we can also give it an offset like this. I could take the white and offset it by five comma five, like that. And now we've got a directional shadow. And as you can imagine, you can extract these out into parameters as well. Right, sorry about that. Uh, it looks like Hulk smashed Xcode, so I uh, had to restart. And the reason I did is because I just wanted to show you one more thing uh, before we finish here. And that is that this approach is also immune to changes in the background color. Uh, and that's something you've got to be aware of when you're using blend modes like Multiply. 
So if we go down here and we change this to have a background color, uh, so let's say background is equal to color white 0 0.1, ignore safe area like that. And there you can see that there's no darkening of the content of the text. Like we're not multiplying with that background color. And that's something we're going to be considering in the next episode where we're going to be looking at views and shapes. Like I said, that requires a slightly different approach. So join me for that. It's going to be brilliant. If you're finding this useful, then give it a thumbs up. It helps people find the channel. It keeps me smiling on the inside and the outside. If you don't want to miss that next episode, consider subscribing. And you probably won't. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions, please leave them below. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me. See you next time.